Okay. There's some wine in the back for people that may or may not want to drink um, during the program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Artist's Voice, Sadie Barnett in conversation with her father, Rodney Barnett. Uh, my name is Nico Whedon, and I am Public Programs Manager here at the museum. And The Artist's Voice is one of our longest standing program series, and it puts exhibiting artists in conversation with what we call critical dialogue partners, but in this case, it's familial dialogue partners. I mean, it's whatever you want it to be. Um, and we're so excited to have you here all the way from California, so thanks for coming. Um, in today's program, Sadie Barnett will be joined by her father, Rodney Barnett, as they explore the value and complexities of documenting oral history. Sadie's work explores unexpected locations of identity construction, family histories, subculture coding, celebration, and excess. She also deals in the currency of West Coast vernacular, the everyday fantasy and abstraction, and is unconfined to any particular medium. In this program, Sadie will expand on these foundations in her work and interview her father, who's been instrumental in setting up the stages through which she's framed her own memories and self-explorations. From unpacking the narrative of the racetrack to translating anecdotes from the political front lines, the Barnetts will survey the gaps in the way these formative moments are remembered, retold, and omitted in different contexts. And the program will conclude with a question and answer segment. So if you develop any questions throughout the course of the conversation, just hold on to them. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have time to go do a walkthrough of your amazing exhibition. So I'll hand the program over to you, Sadie. Thank you, Nico. Um, can you guys hear me well? Um, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Um, it means a lot to me. And thanks so much to my dad and my mom for coming out from California. Um, it's been an amazing year here at the Studio Museum, um, being artist in residence here. So this feels like a really appropriate way to wrap it up um, and share that with all of you guys. Um. Um, so this is the letter that if you guys have seen the exhibition already, you might recognize, which is a letter that my father wrote on a typewriter to my um, cousin, his niece, um, in 1971. And I don't know if you guys can read it that well in here, but I wanted to start with this because it's sort of uh, the most literal moment where my artwork and my father's story um, come together and since I've um, ever since I was you know old enough to understand anything about politics which probably happened younger than maybe for some people considering my parents um, political activism I've been hearing these stories that my dad had to tell and knowing that it was sort of my um, responsibility and honor and privilege to figure out how to share these stories um, and so far I've found that being an artist is the way that I know how to do that so I figured um, tonight would also be a moment to just like get directly to the source and share some of those stories with you um, so thanks dad for ag agreeing um, so one of the first things that I want to start with. Um, you mentioned to me uh, a photograph. It's not this photograph, but you'll explain what the photograph is that you saw in the Pittsburgh Courier when you were 12 years old um, and that we recently actually saw again on the streets in Harlem. Um, but could you explain what the photograph was to people? Yeah, um, can you hear me all right? Good. Well, when I was about 12 years old, I grew up in uh, West Medford, Massachusetts, and when I was 12 years old, I, you know, I played and had fun with all the other kids, and that's what life was all about. But one day, I opened up a newspaper, and it was called the Pittsburgh Courier, and I didn't know at the time, but it was one of the main papers there fighting for civil rights and uh, the ways of communicating with the uh, black community throughout the country. And I opened the paper up and I, I saw a picture and it, it's a picture of a black man being lynched, burnt alive, and hundreds of white people celebrating, taking parts of the body and everything. I said, I can't believe that. And I 
one of the first times I remember really praying, I said, dear God, please tell me this is not real. At any rate, from then on, I realized that I had a role to play, a responsibility to uh, fight against the, those kinds of things happening. And I got involved at a young age. I was, you know, from a progressive family that, um, you know, studied our history and, and everything. So since 12 years old is when I had that feeling, I have to do something about this to change this. Um, and so you grew up in Medford, which was uh, just outside of Boston. Yeah, uh, West Medford uh, was an all-black uh, community. We only lived on three or four streets in the whole city of uh, Medford, Massachusetts. We couldn't live anywhere else. Those were our streets that we were allowed to live on. And it turns out that West Medford was a black community that goes back to the 1700s. So it was one of the oldest black communities in, in the country. Um, Massachusetts, and, and especially Medford, had slavery. Uh, you know, uh, some of the people who were enslaved in Medford, there's uh, a wall, and they call it the slave wall, that was built by uh, some of the people that were enslaved in Medford. And they also had a community where, you know, I was born that, um, where I guess freed black people live. And uh, so, at any rate, um, it's a community that we, we couldn't live very wide throughout there. It was the most segregated community in Massachusetts. And, but we had our own community center, we had our own park, we had our own culture, we had clubs, we had basketball courts and tennis courts, and, and we weren't really poor. But a lot of the families were aspiring to uh, do other things to, you know, somebody told me uh, when I went back for a visit that uh, a lot of the families there, um, they considered their success based on how many white people they knew or something like that, you know. But uh, overall, people had uh, good jobs. In fact, the movie The Butler, the actual main butler that wasn't the film wasn't about actually was from my community in West Medford and we could see him when I was little taking the train you know to DC um, and anyway um, <coughs> it was a very segregated community when something happened uh, where if there was a fight between a black person and a white person the police came to all the teenagers house and took us down you know to the police station um, one thing that well this is actually your father in the top left corner here right. um, and I know that both of your parents were you know very progressive and thought a lot about the importance of you know us knowing our black history can you talk about that a little bit yeah well one of the first things that happened to me uh, besides when I was 12 years old I first went to kindergarten and in the schools in Medford um, they were very um, you know I was the only black student in my whole kindergarten class. But they had a book that they, um, one of the textbooks, and it was called Little Black Sambo. And the first day I went to school, the teacher tried to force me to stand up on a chair in front of the class while the students read the book Little Black Sambo. Has anybody ever heard of that book? Okay, it's, it was a required textbook back in my day uh, to reinforce the stereotypes of black people. It's about uh, this family in Africa. They dressed, they dressed real crazy with all kinds of different clashing colors, and they chased a tiger around the tree until the tiger turned to butter, and then uh, the mother could make pancakes and, and so forth. That was the story of Little Black Symbol. I don't think they teach that anymore but uh, anyhow um, you know there were a lot of things that happened um, in growing up there in, in Medford so what happened when they asked you to stand on the table when you were five years old well I refused to do it I mean I, for one thing, for, I don't know what why but I didn't want to stand up in front of a whole class of people and they actually slapped me around expelled me from kindergarten so 
Right. So you were five years old. Five years old. The first time I got kicked out of school, right. <laughs> um, and then there's a story that you told about your mom, who it was actually a similar incident involving school and another child. Right. Her child. E exactly. Um, my mother, um, one of the next door neighbors, uh, and I think um, the family was from one of the islands, and uh, uh, their children uh, were going to school in. Uh, I think it was like high school and they were singing one of the songs they sang was Old Black Joe and it turns out that my next door neighbor son was named Joe and so they would sing that song and make fun of him and you know just real racist stuff but <clears throat> when my mother heard about it she marched up to the school and demanded that they stop you know singing that song and making him and black people uh you know the victims of uh, their entertainment and then another thing that you mentioned um was that your dad used to oh. i guess uh not tell stories but almost give history lessons yeah um you know my family moved to west memphis in like 1944 my father had been in uh, World War One, and was part of the uh, outfits that liberated the French, and came back, uh, you know, kind of a different person um, because of the French people at that time treated black people like they were human beings. Um, it was very, it was in a segregated uh, outfit and so forth and so on. But um, my father, uh, he taught at Tuskegee at some point when he was really young, and so when he came to Medford. A lot of the people in West Medford uh, didn't really connect to the African American history and so forth and so on. But my father was very really knowledgeable about it. So a lot of the kids started coming to our house and getting lessons in black history from my father. Okay, I think that's just like an important uh, sort of setup for the foundation of um, like, you got it honest, this you know, need to talk about history and change the current condition. Um, could you talk about how you got involved with the Nation of Islam? Yeah, um, well, <coughs> maybe people do or don't know, but um, uh, there was a civil rights movement in the early 60s, and... <laughs> 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 I, I, that's not the point there, but <laughs> but there, there was a civil rights movement, but there also was a more militant movement than uh, the, what Martin Luther King was leading, and it was Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. And so uh, a lot of people uh, my age and my older brothers were chose to be involved in a more militant black liberation movement as opposed to turning the other cheek uh, like Martin Luther King uh, and then were proposing. So I um, uh, followed the suit of my couple of my brothers joined the, the Nation of Islam and when I was 17, 18 years old I, I joined it also. And um, you know what eventually happened was the, uh, there was a split between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And it wasn't just a difference of opinion. There's a lot going on. But I think Malcolm was unhappy about the Nation of Islam preaching one thing about being militant and not really doing anything, you know, kind of waiting on Allah to come back uh, and organizing. And, you know, I don't mean to be critical, but that's what uh, one of the things that caused the split. So when that split did happen, um, my family and myself, we were more uh, wanted to, you know, follow Malcolm's teaching uh, more than Elijah Muhammad. So uh, we, we left the Nation of Islam. I have uh, my mother's uh, sister's oldest son was shot in the head and killed in Los Angeles when the first people killed by the LAPD uh, back in 1962, I think it was. So. And that was actually Ronald Stokes, who some people uh, might know the name since that uh, did a lot to maybe galvanize or make people more aware of the 
police brutality, especially in Los Angeles. Right, and, and you can see if you go back and look some of the old pictures and uh, like Google Malcolm X, a lot of the pictures he's holding up. Um, it's Muhammad Speaks newspaper with a picture of my cousin laying down on the ground bleeding. And, um, you know, he, the Muslims were angry about that being able to happen. Uh, you know, the Muslims didn't attack people or anything like that. So, um, anyhow. Yeah. So, you were drafted um, to the Army. I was wondering if you could talk about that and talk about... Um, your experience as an African American soldier, both in relation to like the white authority and um mm -hmm. yeah, um, after um, having a little vacation from the movement um, and uh, living a life of a old teenager, uh, I moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, you know, and got a job uh, working with one of my brothers there, selling shoes and. You know, go to nightclub and so forth and so on. And all of a sudden, I got a notice from the Medford, Massachusetts uh, draft board that I was being drafted in, into the army. In in those days, they had a draft. You didn't have to volunteer, you know, to be in the army. You were drafted into the army. So, you know, with my background, I, I didn't see why they would take me anyhow. But I had a tendency to refuse to, to go. I didn't want to go, but I had a discussion with my family, and my brothers were all, I had a brother who was in uh, the Korean War, I had a brother um, who was in the Air Force and the Navy, so they had been in the military. They said, Rodney, go in the Army, you know, two years, it'll be over before you know it. And at that time, the war in Vietnam wasn't really known that well you know, when I was drafted. But one of the things that I realized when, when I was drafted, the first getting together of people who were drafted really reflected what the United States of America looked like racially. So they had a lot of white people, there were black people, Asians and, um, you know, Latinos and so forth that were drafted. And I could look around the room and so forth. But what happened, the closer you got to danger, the more African-American the companies, the units, had become. Even when uh, you finished uh, basic training, then the numbers increased to like 50% African-Americans when you went to your next assignment, which was advanced infantry. So all you could do, all we were smart enough to do was to learn how to fire weapons and be on the front line. Uh, so. <coughs> Even when uh, we finished basic training, um, you know, during the training, we had a, a short leave, and some of those African-American soldiers went into town and went to demand to, to be served. They were very segregated. They called the police on us. Uh, we were arrested and by the military police for, for doing that, and we were um, punished, you know, uh, and we, we, they, they considered us AWOL. And they wound up uh, giving us a lighter sentence called an Article 15, where they took our pay from us and so forth and so on. But it just goes to show you that the contradictions that, you know, in my life I was beginning to uh, become aware of and, and, and face. So, you know, uh, by the time we got to where out of the country soldiers were going, they were sending a lot of the white soldiers to Germany. And everybody I knew that was African American was going to Vietnam. And even when you got to Vietnam, you know, you went with a battalion, you were assigned to a battalion, and they had A, B, C, D company, and, you know, those companies winded up being predominantly African American, Latino, and Asian. And I'm not saying that there weren't any white fighters, because there certainly were, but I'm just saying in proportion to our population, in this country, it was way out of proportion when we had to face danger, go out on the front line and so forth. So, um, anyhow, in, in Vietnam, um, Vietnam, I wound up um, getting wounded. I, uh, I think it was me that hit a booby trap, and I got wounded in um, my leg, and unfortunately, the same booby trap killed one of the other uh, 
infantryman, a good friend of mine, 19 years old, and they a helicopter came to take us both to a hospital, and you know, I held his hand, and his chest was just bleeding out, spitting out blood, and he died. And anyhow, after I was um, after that happened, uh, they put me on restricted duty, so I wasn't supposed to do any heavy because I was supposed to be recuperating in in the camp in, in the barracks. But there was a young white officer who just got out of whatever I forget the school they go to to become officers. Uh, but he just came. It was he was assigned to Vietnam. Came into my barracks. And I was sitting down, and my leg was still bandaged all up and everything. But he demanded that I stand up and salute him. And he said, boy, don't you know who I am? I said, no, you ain't my daddy. But he walked out, stormed out, went and got the first sergeant and told him I refused to stand up and salute him. And I had to go to the first sergeant's um, you know, office and, and explain why I didn't salute this officer. And the first sergeant, I don't know how to say this, kicked me in the groin, you know. So we had a little scuffle there. And he wasn't that big anyhow. I kind of threw him outside the hooch. But then they arrested me for assault and battery against a non-commissioned officer. And um, so I was, um, you know, they, I didn't go to the jail, because I don't think they had a jail then, but I couldn't leave the barracks. I was under house arrest, so to speak. And uh, just the whole thing. And uh, actually, I winded up, I wrote a letter to my congressman. I think I was in Cleveland. I think it was Carl Stokes at the time, and complained about what happened to me. My sister wrote a letter to him. And anyhow, they eventually dropped the charges against me. But when they dropped the charges against me, I went to the, uh, I, I forget, there's a general that's supposed to look out for the rank and file soldier. Uh, and I went and complained to him. He said, well, um, Private Barnett, it seems like you can't get along in the company you're in, so we're going to transfer you, you out. So they transferred me to another company, and I spent the rest of my tour in Vietnam in uh section called the headquarters company they didn't really go out and you know we were when we were in the front lines they flew us out in helicopters dropped us off uh, the areas were all the foliage was all dead they had you know dropped agent orange in there and so forth I remember one time we came back the village uh, was, was deserted you know chickens and stuff running around uh, and Somebody found an old man down like in a tunnel, which the Vietnamese took for coverage uh, when they were b being bombed and stuff. It was an old man in his 80s. So, you know, that was our great thing. We captured a prisoner and brought him back to the, to the base camp. And we had to rotate guard uh, duty. Uh, and when I got up there, it was my turn to guard him. The soldiers were, you know, torturing him. Not really trying to kill them, but harassing them, poking them with the bayonets and stuff like that. I said, hey, why are you doing that? You know, this guy can't even how they walk. You know, anyhow, uh, so I actually told him, I said, if I thought you could get out of here alive, I'd let you go. <laughs> so. Can you say a little bit um, about, like, the Vietnamese people that you... Right. That, that was the other thing. Um, the, we, the, the United States had what they called a pacification program. So the, uh, the unit that I was in, which was the uh, 25th Infantry Division, Wolfhounds, um, brought people in uh, from the villages and stuff, Vietnamese. And it wasn't really just Vietnamese either. There were other nationalities that lived in Vietnam, not just the Viet Like I know that there were Cambodians and stuff. You could tell they looked a little different from the average Vietnamese. But they uh, could speak a little English and so forth. But they would come to the, the black soldiers and they would say, same, same. And, you know, it really meant something that they were trying to say. They knew 
about our status in the United States, you know, believe it or not. And they were telling, telling me and telling other soldiers, look, we both got problems here, you know. And we used to tell them, oh, you're all Viet Cong, blah, blah, blah. It turns out after, years after the, the war ended, that they discovered that there were tunnels under the base camp so that they could take things in and out. But this is really strange. It might be true and it may not. But w at first, we would go out on what they called search and destroy missions. And the helicopters would take, you know, well, half a dozen helicopters would drop a whole company out uh, into the rice paddies. And they wouldn't land. We had to jump out. And we went to some strategic areas that the Army wanted us to go and clear for other units, like engineers, to come in. And when we would go a couple of times to these places, we didn't find any, uh, we weren't met with a, you know, a battle with the Viet Cong, uh, as they called them. And it was really strange, because they would fly us out, and we would look for tunnels and do everything. And then when we would go back, um, following that, the outfits that were not as mixed, not as African American would go, the engineers, and it'd be big war, you know, and I just think that that had something to do with it, that they uh, were going to give us grace because they thought we were oppressed people in the United States, and anyway, that was my opinion, and I thought that that's what they were trying to say, when, same, same, why would you say that? It's not because you're discovering that there's some other people with color to them, at any rate, um, it's part of um, what I believe. Yeah, um, I think it's um, similar to the connection that was made internationally. Um, I mean, one question that I had, you know, you had some moments within the Army when you, um, you know, had like moments of rebellion, um, but you guys weren't really aware of the anti-war movement that was starting until you came back, right? Right. Um, and one of the things that happened, uh, when, when my term, my 13 months in Vietnam uh, was over, and, you know, it was really sad time because people, soldiers that I went there with, uh, the first day that you know, we got there, one of the, my friends who got killed on the first day, and there were a list of people who, were, you know, got killed there in, in Vietnam in my hometown. Um, you know, people were killed. And actually, when I got transferred back to, to the base, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, um, there was, I, and I can't remember where it was exactly, but there was a so-called uh, riot going on in one of the cities, and I think it was, may have been Detroit. And... Um, like a civil rights yeah, riot. Right, right, right. And um, so we were told that we were going to be put on standby to go here and to help quell the rebellion in the black community there in Detroit. And, you know, here we are, a bunch of soldiers who have been through hell, uh, you know, and came back to the United States, uh, weren't treated right anyhow, and the black soldiers saying, start meeting, we're not going. We're not going to go and, and fight with our uh, people who are fighting, you know, for their rights in these different cities, whether you call them uh, riots or not. Uprisings, we call them. Right, uprisings. But <laughs> what really happened was we got together and started talking about it. And you know, I don't know whether it was my idea or not, but I said, well, your idea? idea? <laughs> I said, well, <clears throat> I think what we should do is we should go. And we should make sure that people don't shoot our people down and just uh, ask them for rights. And, you know, the, the Army got a, aware of uh, our, you know, discontent with uh, even being asked. So that, that was canceled. Uh, anyhow, I got out of uh, the Army and uh, moved back to um, Cleveland. And before I know it, my sister's son got killed in Vietnam. And so I came out... Um, to go uh, to his funeral, and I looked at the news in Los Angeles, and the police were doing the same things that we did in Vietnam. They were having search and destroy missions, lined up, 
going through uh, black neighborhoods in, in, in the yards and everything. Somebody robbed a bank. And that's so they were looking for, you know, in those days, there were no black policemen in Los Angeles. They were recruiting the police from Alabama and Mississippi and other southern states. And, you know, you couldn't get a, a job as a cop back then. Anyhow, um, but what, what, what I found out was that there was an, well, I joined the Panthers. I said, well, you know, I, I don't think it's right for me to put my... <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so, um, you know, they they had killed some uh, black people in Los Angeles, the police, and um, I joined the Panthers. I worked for the post office. Uh, I got a job working for the post office. Um, and um, so after work, I would go to the Panther office and, and help you know, to do things. We would go to colleges and, and speak on campuses and, you know, trying to organize it. And, you know, what people don't know is the Panther Party was very popular. You know, there were lots of people who were joining the, the Panther Party, there was, um, ministers and teachers and, and so forth. And one of the big things that we were doing was a, a breakfast program for children, which was unheard of in the United States of America at that time. So, at any rate, um, I got involved in that, and I actually um, opened up uh, the ninth office uh, in the L.A. area, which they called Sections. So I opened up Section 9 in downtown Compton uh, at the time. But at the same time, there were some strange things that were, were going on within the party, within the Panther Party. And... All of a sudden, these people came from the Panther Underground. They said, we're from the Panther Underground, and we must make anew the discipline in the party. And a quote from Mousy Tongue. I said, okay. Um, so we have to be more disciplined. And they said, Rodney, as a section leader of uh, Section 9, you have to start enforcing the discipline. And if uh, members are late for the meetings, you have to discipline them. I discipline them how? You have to beat them with these sticks. I said, are you crazy? How are we going to make a, a, how can we distinguish the police beating people up and us beating people up? They said, well, you either do it or leave. So I, I left at that time. I said, that's crazy. And, uh, you know, I spent months, um, you know, I, was inv I got involved in the anti-war movement. Uh, and I spent most of my time uh, doing that, uh, going to protest rallies and marching, uh, and you know, in, in those days, the media covered a little more about what was going on in Vietnam. And I think one of the things that really shocked a lot of Americans was when the president of South Vietnam stood in the middle of the street with a gun and shot somebody right in the head. You know, and that was on the news. They don't show you stuff like that anymore. You know, <laughs> they don't show you how the danger that the soldiers uh, are facing every day um, you know, in these wars that we're having all over the place. At any rate, um, so the, the anti-war movement w was successful. There was hundreds of thousands of people protesting and demanding an end to the war. So I actually, one of the big demonstrations that we had was going to be in San Francisco. So from Los Angeles, we had like half a dozen buses that were taking people up uh, to the Bay Area to this um, anti-war protest. And we started from downtown uh, San Francisco and we're marching to Golden Gate Park. And, you know, it's three or four miles. Of, San Francisco is only seven miles long anyhow. But, um, but marching in the march, people were so supportive everywhere people had their windows open were cheering you on giving the peace sign playing music and then people joined in the march on the way to golden gate park i said wow it wasn't really like that in la because everybody's driving all the time for one thing you don't never see nobody walking uh, it was the same you know back then but in san francisco real clearly anti-war the whole community was against the war and, um, you know, anyhow, after that, um, you know, I um, went back to, to L.A. and 
the FBI made a visit to probably most of my family at that time to harass my family all over the country, not just in L.A., but uh, they went um, to Cleveland, they were in Massachusetts, uh, asking questions right there in L.A. When I first moved to L.A., I stayed with my brother and his sister-in-law, and they came to their house and, you know, just harassment. Anyhow, they got me fired from the post office, and they gave me a letter saying that I was fired for conduct unbecoming of a government employee. Uh, and I don't have to go in more details, but at any rate, I was out of a job. I was out of the Panthers, and I said, you know, I, I think I need to learn more about what this whole thing is about. You know, it's not that, that simple of a thing. And so I began to read W.A.B. Du Bois, and, and just uh, I was so thankful to be able to read some of his stuff. And then I, I read Karl Marx and stuff, and I really feel like I came out with a much clearer understanding what our fight was all about. You know, it wasn't just about race. Uh, it, was, it had to do with working people and so forth. At any rate, uh, after I lost my job, ran out of money, I said, well, I'm going to take a bus and hop up to San Francisco, and I got a room at the YMCA, uh, shaved my beard off, bought a coat at the Goodwill store, and I got hired that next day at Macy's department store, and um, you know lived there for, for 30 years. And it's um, uh, one question before uh, we head to San Francisco um, <laughs> was you mentioned the FBI briefly, but um, could you explain to people what COINTELPRO was when you were in the Panthers, and do you think that that had anything to do with like the so-called new leadership? and the like suggestions right um you know um you know i was convinced and um that a lot of folks that uh, were claiming to be leaders in the panther party uh, uh were uh informants you know uh, and they were advocating you know we didn't really talk all the time about often the pigs and the violence and stuff we were organizing you know in the community and um so but it became more uh, uh, of that. And <coughs> um, recently, I, I wrote uh, in the last few years uh, a letter asking for files uh, that they may have on me and Angela Davis, uh, you know, and so forth. It turns out they said, well, you have to get Angela Davis' permission. And wow, I have to try to kill her? Now you're protecting her privacy? At any rate, they, they sent uh, some pages of stuff. Uh, most everything was redacted. But you could see they had all these different informants at the meetings. And they were talking about, they were making stories up about what the Panthers were doing. They said, well, Rodney Barnett, um, is the assistant section leader of uh, section number nine, and he said that they could go blow up all the police cars and uh, the parking lot. And you know, just reading that, how many years is that ago? It's 1969, 70. Uh, I just recently read all that stuff. They gave me these files uh, a few months ago. There's still 400, 500 pages they said they have about me. That they won't show, right? That they're going to uh, right. consider, uh, and they'll get to it, um, you know, after a while. Anyhow, but, yeah, there was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it came out in the last 10 years or whenever it was, they had a program called Cointel Pro. Not only did they try to uh, uh, ruin the Panthers, but they blackmailed Martin Luther King, and, you know, in every aspect of the movement that we had we had agents uh, from the FBI that was um, trying to you know kill people they actually uh, two people that were killed in the Panthers after I joined were people I got to know really well and they made it look like there was this other rival organization that killed them but recently this uh, ex FBI agent confessed that I'm the one that killed them the FBI so they were very active, uh, you know, Richard Nixon, I think, was president. Um, at any rate, mm -hmm. let me know if I'm talking too much. <laughs> <You're great. laughs> um, okay, so moving to San Francisco. Um, <laughs> so that's my dad, the handsome one in the middle there, <laughs> um, next to Angela Davis. 
uh, and that's uh, Kendra Alexander. She was very, very active in the whole peace movement, the Panthers and everything like that. And that's one of the attorneys, her name is Doris Walker. And behind me is um, Howard Moore, one of Angela's attorney. That's Angela's mother there, and her brother. Uh, and I think that picture was, oh, that picture was taken um, the day of the verdict uh, of finding innocent uh, Angela not guilty of, um, at any rate, so there's some stories to, to tell about that whole. Can you tell us some of them? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us how you started, how you got involved? Uh, I, was, um, I was going to, a, to school, junior college, and I actually happened to move up. Uh, from San Francisco up further north. Uh, I went to San Rosa Junior College. And when there was um, Jonathan Jackson was a young African American, 15 years old. He worked with Angela in Southern California. And Angela Davis is the first person who I heard, who I knew was involved in the uh, freeing political prisoners from, from prison. I never heard nobody talk about, you know, the people who were political prisoners. What happened in California, they had this sentencing that they called the indeterminate sentence. So George Jackson was supposed to be involved in a robbery of a gas station, and he was a driver, and he was sentenced under the indeterminate sentence. So what that mean, meant was uh, you didn't get a date that you're going to get out of jail. And if you weren't a good person in jail, they could continue to keep you in prison. So he was in jail for I forget how many years when he went for uh, you know going to jail for being accessory to a robbery. Um, they wouldn't let him out because he began to write about the prison and uh, about black freedom and liberation, and they wouldn't let him out. So Angela, uh, there was this group of people like him called the Soledad Brothers. And, and Angela was organizing in Los Angeles a um, you know, movement to free political prisoners. And she's the first person I ever heard use the term prison industrial complex. You know, here we got prisons that make profit off of putting people in prison uh, industry. At any rate, um, Jonathan worked on um, the committee in Los Angeles, and his brother, he never knew his brother outside of his brother being in prison. When, when Jonathan uh, was born, his brother was in prison already, and he only knew his brother for 15 years of his life uh, by visiting him in prison. And, and George Jackson wrote essays, and he wrote a book, and everything, and Jonathan got very frustrated with the movement not being able to free him and so forth and decided to go to a hearing in San, um, in Marin County and, <coughs> and came in there with some guns and when the, jury, the judge ordered the uh, court to come to order, Jonathan stood up and said, I'm taking this court over. He was 15 years old, he had a couple of guns and they uh, winded up taking a couple of uh, prisoners that were on trial, um, you know, they f freed them, they took a judge as hostage, but the county sheriff's rule never let a prisoner escape. The county sheriff killed Jonathan Jackson, they killed a judge too. And at any rate, they used that as an excuse to go after Angela. They wanted to kill her. so. Here you got the President of the United States going on national TV saying that she's a terrorist and we're going to get her. She's put on the FBI's most wanted list, 10 most wanted list. At any rate, you know, and so the news started coming out. I was uh, not in contact with Angela. I didn't really know Angela that well, although we were in some meetings in L.A. together, but I didn't know who she was. But when this happened, I said, oh, man, this is crazy. They're going after her, accusing her of conspiracy to commit this, um, you know, breaking these prisoners out of jail and want, uh, want to try her for uh, the, the killing this judge and, and so forth. Anyhow, so we began to organize on the campus that I was uh, going to school at, and it's kind of a conservative, uh, you know, um, nowadays I would call it a 
progressive community, <laughs> how conservative uh, things are now. But anyway, it was a conservative community. There weren't that many black people there. Um, there were, um, but we organized these massive, you know, not massive, but big demonstrations on the campus. You know, we showed a movie uh, to raise funds, and it turns out that eventually, um, when Angela, well, I call it gave up, her, but when they caught Angela, she was going to have a trial right there next to uh, uh, Santa Rosa in Marin County in San Rafael. So uh, our organizing on campus already ahead and in advance of her being captured was a good thing because they brought it to a Marin County jail and they began to have hearings. So we were able to get people to go to, to the hearings. So we had carpools from Santa Rosa, we'd drive up there and show the judge, the prosecution, and the, and the media that Angela has support. This is not just about her. It's about um, you know the freedom to be able to. Angela had gotten fired from being a professor at UCLA. You know, that's the first thing, and, and they really wanted to get her, you know, for that. <coughs> At any rate, <coughs> when I was um, organizing, we were able to pack the courtroom, had big lines waiting for uh, people waiting to get in and so forth, and um, had a good committee and so forth. And what the um, legal defense was doing at the time was demanding a change of venue. Uh, there were no black people living in Marin County, and um, that's where the, this episode took place outside of the Marin County Courthouse. So uh, the defense asked for a change in venue. Um, you know, the committee had um, two different approaches to winning the freedom, legal. Can you explain what the National Committee was and when they asked you to be on it and how that? Okay, yeah, well, so what happened was um, because of our uh, success in organizing and we, we winded up getting a change of venue from, we were asking for a change of venue from Marin County to San Francisco County. We were more, rep we wanted a jury of Angela's peers and you're most likely to get that in uh, San Francisco where there are a lot of people of color and so forth and so on. At any rate, um, the judge ordered the trial in Santa Clara County, which was pretty much the same as Marin County. It was less than one percent population of uh, you know African Americans that lived in, in, in San Jose. At any rate, <coughs> the um, people on the national committee, because I was on a local committee, they approached me and asked me if I would be willing to join the national committee. On the national committee, there were like ten people. And they asked me to be one of the organizers to participate in the decisions and so forth and so on. I said, well, um, I think I'll be willing to do that, but there's just something that you really need to know in case it ever comes up as a source of embarrassment to the committee or anything like that. And I said, I'm gay. And if that's a problem with the committee, then you need to think about that uh, in the long term. And they said, that's not a problem. And so from then on, I moved to San Jose. And the, the actual issue of um, being gay came up a lot. And it was really like I found myself being like, more like a teacher to some other people to explain what, what that meant and, and so forth. At any rate, um, that's uh, one of the first things that happened. I moved to San Jose. Um, and join the National Committee. Join the National Free Committee. Free Angela Davis. Right. And then, um, I don't know if it's skipping ahead too much, but if you could talk about, um, like, when she was released from, or maybe before that, you could talk about when you were doing the jury selection. Right. Um, uh, okay, so they scheduled Angela's trial uh, in uh, San Jose. And, um, you know, one of the first legal things we had to do was to void the jurors. To, uh, and, you know, part of our public demand, and keep in mind, there's a legal defense and there was a public organizing of, you know, people wrote, 
letters, thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters were coming in every day in support of Angela, and from different countries too. You know, there's so much mail, bag loads of mail that they would bring in. So it was it turned them to be a, a, of international interest. This uh, trial of Angela and stuff. Uh, she actually went, you know, to school in Germany and studied and stuff like that. She was a very smart professor. And at any rate, so we were demanding that some people of color be on the jury. This is a story I'm not sure many people know about, but as a defense committee, people from the community would tell us about different people who were coming in uh, for jury selection. And um, <coughs> so what happened was the mostly all right uh, jurors that we had to pick from. And, you know, we made a public thing out of it. Well, we need some people of, you know, color to be honest. It's not going to be a jury of a beer. So there was a woman who came up who, I don't have to mention the nationality that, that she was, but she wasn't white. And <clears throat> so some people from the community had said, don't let her be on the jury. She's already made statements that she would hang Angela if she had a chance. And so we said, oh my God, what are we going to do? We have a right to kick anybody off to use one of our challenges, but how is it going to make us look when we're demanding that somebody colored be on the jury and we go and kick the first person that comes up of color off of the jury. But guess what happened? The government kicked her off. No, no color people. <laughs> and that's no question. They just got rid of her. Anyhow, that's the kind of thing that was happening. Uh, the community was really uh, in support. At any rate, um, part of the, how's that time? Part of, um, part of, um, Part of our uh, strategy <coughs> in, in those days uh, and during the trial was to get Angela released on bail. And because she was charged with a capital crime where she could get the death penalty, uh, the, you couldn't release her on bail, at least according to them. So they wouldn't let her. So she spent you know, more than a year uh, in, in jail or two years while the trial w was going on. But what happened was there's a, uh, a professor from Stanford University who was arguing uh, before the Supreme Court against the death penalty. And he, you know, his name was Amsterdam, um, Professor Amsterdam, something like that. And he argued that the death penalty was cruel and unusual punishment and should be against the law. So the justices on the court of um, California Supreme Court, they ruled in his favor. So then they didn't have an excuse why Angela couldn't get out on bail. So we had a big bail fight then, and then the judge he couldn't do anything. He says, okay, you know, a million dollars bail. So one of the great memories that I had of, uh, after that happened was that I was assigned with a woman named, a real good friend of mine, Victoria Mercado. She had an old yellow riding Mustang, and we were assigned to pick Angela up out of jail when, when they released her. And one of the things that, you know, the sheriffs offered to escort us to where we were going. And we said, well, no, thank you. And, you know, we're, we're okay. But <clears throat> one of the uh, organizations that we worked with in San Jose was called the Community Alert Patrol. There had been some police killings in San Jose, so there was a predominantly Latino Chicano uh, organization. They had two-way radios, big old radios, and they had cameras, and they were monitoring the police. And so, you know, they, we, we worked with them every day. But was, uh, when we got Angela out of jail, got her in the car, we had to go 15 miles or so to get her to where she was going to live for the remainder of the trial. And do you know that this organization blocked off every traffic intersection where we never had to stop? I said, man, this is like freedom, boy. We're just going through the city. We never stop one time because they were blocking off the traffic and uh, coming the other way, coming the other way in every direction. And, you know, just... And, and you know, I just think that this, th that movement was an important movement because of how it, 
you know, transpired, uh, the support that we had, and, and the meaning of it. I mean, this is a government trying to kill Angela Davis and kill our movement, to tell you the truth, you know, whoever was behind it. Um, and um, we, we were able to win uh, Angela's freedom. You know, and it wasn't just the legal stuff that happened in the court. It was uh, our ability to organize in, in, in the community and to get that kind of support. Everybody knew that uh, Angela was supported, not just by black people either. You know, it was just widespread and it was really a great coalition of uh, people got together, white, Latinos, Asians, everybody, and so forth. And so, and then during the trial after she was released on bail, you guys, you and Angela and Victoria, who's my middle name, is who I'm named after, shout out, um, all were living together, right? So this was like your, it's not like a day job where you're going and working on the campaign, but you guys are like living together, it's 24-7, you know, her safety and the organizing, and I, I mean, I can only imagine like the conversations that must have been happening, you know, at that living room table right. you know this is yeah well you know one of my uh, responsibilities changed after angela got out of jail and um i was the one that was made responsible uh, some people call it responsible for her security but mostly i was supposed to make sure she got the court on time because if she was late for court they would suspend her bail and so that's what, you know, every day, when, you know, we went to court uh, so that she would get there on time. And, you know, um, she wasn't really allowed to speak publicly either uh, while she was out on bail. But, you know, we still had rallies because, you know, her trial was still going on. And so, but um, that's how I got to, you know, be really close um, friends with Angela. And then, you know, um I know that there's so many details of you know the legal strategy and of the organizing that we don't have time to go into and obviously people um, you know have written a lot of books Angela wrote a book about the experience as well as her many other amazing books and who are some of the other people that wrote that you mentioned like uh, who wrote books about the trial yeah that <coughs> um, <coughs> there was, um, there's a woman named Patina Apiker. Her father was kind of like a famous professor too, uh, and an author, Herbert Apiker. She wrote a couple of books. The the woman who winded up being the foreperson on the jury, her name was Mary Timothy. She wrote a book about the trial, and um, you know, so it was a. It's a, we could learn a lot of lessons if we would go back and read some of the, the literature and stuff on how to organize. Mm -hmm defense of people um, and I think you know just the fact that uh, you guys won <laughs> um, you know it was a it wasn't um, it was an amazing moment and it was a, a moment for grassroots organizing and for the movement um, yeah, uh, well, one of the things is that <coughs> when the trial was over we didn't just drop you know, uh, everything and go on vacation forever. We continue that because there are other political prisoners. And uh, at that time, I, I started going to San Francisco State University and um, we organized uh, different groups on the campus to fight against some, um, you know, uh, political prisoners. There was a group called the Wilmington 10, which consisted of. Um, young teenagers in Wilmington, North Carolina, and Reverend Ben Chavis, who later on became um, president of the NAACP, Ben Chavis. But they had convicted these kids and gave them life in prison for burning a bond down. That's what they were accused of. So we took on a lot of cases and organized across the country, <coughs> continued to you know, fight for freedom for the Solidarity Brothers and San Quentin Six, and you know, it, you know, it's a mess all over the place. Um, so. Well, I have a story that I sometimes tell people. When I was organizing at uh, San Francisco State, um, different people came to help to organize, and we were going around the room introducing ourselves, well, you know. And then, so one of the 
guys introduce himself. He says, well, um, I'm here at San Francisco State, and um, I'm active, and uh, I want to be an actor. I said, hmm, cool. I thought to myself, you don't really look like an actor to me. But it turns out it was Danny Glover. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow. It so worked out all right. Yeah. <laughs> So I was mistaken. <laughs> um, well, after like the Angela campaign and the other camp um, political prisoner campaigns, you were involved in um, the labor movement a lot, and I feel like that's almost a whole another chapter that we could get into. Um, but since we don't have time to do that, I want to fit one more thing in to talk about before we open up for questions. Um, okay. which is the bar, as we right, um, call it in our family. Okay. Um, That's not my dad, I should point out. <laughs> my dad's more handsome. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, living in, in San Francisco, and I, you know, just one thing to mention again about the trials, that during the time they were looking for Angela, if you lived in San Francisco and you were black, even if you were a man, you were going to be stopped by the police because they're looking for Angela and every black face, they would stop you, you know. But at any rate, um, San Francisco uh, was my home and <coughs> it had begun to take on the reputation uh, of a progressive city and um, it was, uh, they were tolerant with uh, other people's sexual preference and so forth and so on and it began to get bigger and bigger and get a reputation as the gay capital of the world, to tell you the truth. Uh, and that's all fine and good, but actually, you know, uh, it was one of my first experiences too with really socializing with, with people of different uh, ethnic races and white people, and, and they were all really good people. I said, well, I didn't know white people were good like that, but... <laughs> so, <coughs> but anyhow, but there was a problem because I think what was happening is that the, the gay issue is, I think, is more than just the issue of being gay, but an issue of class, too, because they were opening up a lot of gay bars in San Francisco and restaurants and stuff, but black people weren't allowed to go in those bars. You know, I, you know, when I would, we, we wanted to go out and dance somewhere, we had to show three pieces of ID. And it's really, you know, and that didn't change. And I don't think that the average gay person was like that, but whoever owned these businesses, they brought their racism with them. You would think that um, being a victim of homophobia would automatically say, don't discriminate against anybody. But such is not the case. So, and it's so funny because one place that we tried to go into, oh, they humiliated us so much, you know, that I said, well, I'm never going back there again because I'm going to kill somebody, I think. But then I picked up a newspaper a couple of months after that, and there was some picketing in that same bar. And um, um, I said, like, wow, I wish I knew who that was because that, I, I'd help out with that. That's the same place where they won't let us in. You know, it's bullshit. Excuse me, I swear a lot, but I'm trying not. <laughs> <coughs> Anyhow, um, some years later, I had a chance to, to buy a bar, a cl uh, you know, lounge up in, in San Francisco. And with the help of my family, you know, borrowed money, um, um, my, I had a brother who had died and, you know, left money, you know, for our family, not much, but, you know, uh, to, so we, we used that and got money from our family members and I uh, bought a liquor license. And I said, oh man, we're going to make this the first black owned gay bar in the history of San Francisco. And it's going to be a place where people can walk in there and never have to be concerned about being turned away and, uh, you know, being hated or anything like that. So we opened up this bar called the Eagle Creek. I have, uh, my brothers, uh, who were very straight, came up to help with it, built, rebuilt the whole place. First thing we did was knocked out the front wall and put a big picture window in, in front. Then we opened up the place. Um, did you have a question? 
<laughs> but you know, uh, it, so at the time, it became like a community center. Even some of the politicians in San Francisco running for the board of supervisors would ask if they could come and campaign, you know, in the bar. We we had organizations. We were raising money uh, uh, for different organizations that were fighting against AIDS, which was you know kind of new. You know, at that point when I opened the bar, it was only like five years old since uh, people were start to die from, from AIDS. So we had fundraisers and other benefits there. It really became a, a community thing. Uh, when I first opened the bar, the gay newspaper wrote this editorial warning white gay people, don't go there, it's a deadly place, it's dangerous. Oh man. So we actually had one of our members uh, was a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, and we got together and we wrote a response to that and demanded a retraction, and they did retract it. But it just goes to show you how thoroughly, you know, it's not easy to get people out of racism, you know. Even if you had a own place to go, they said, don't go there, they'll kill you. Didn't invite you anyway. <laughs> but, but you did actually invite everybody because it was a very right. um, inclusive place. Right. Yeah, we had a slogan called, uh, a friendly place for every race with a funky bass. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was called the Eagle Creek Saloon, mostly because that was the name of the bar. Originally, it's kind right. of a tradition to keep the same name. Right. Um, but you completely redid the bar, turned it into like a, you know, something I always thought was important was that, like, the, you know, as an artist, the visuals of the bar was really important to to you. So if it was going to be a right. black bar, it was going to be a nice, right. fancy, yeah. beautiful place to be. Yeah, not necessarily fancy, but clean. And you know, the bathrooms. If you go into a you know average bar, and I'm not talking about these big fancy nightclubs, the bathrooms are nasty. You know, so I said, well, we're gonna redo those whole bathrooms, and then uh, if you touch the plumbing in a place, you have to get a permit, and they had to be handicapped, accessible, and stuff. So my brother, Kyle, we got an architect to design the bar. I remember the Kyle <coughs> built two beautiful bathrooms. They were, you know, real big. We had the plumbing from the street under the bar all the way to the end, and, and it was really a really nice place. The problem is that uh, it was during a period, too, where the economy had taken a big dive, and a lot of the people who were customers and stuff uh, lost their jobs. I even tried to help somebody pay their rent. Uh, at any rate, <coughs> I operated it for about three years, but it couldn't really continue to keep it open. I didn't own the building, for one thing. And back in 1990, the rent was $4,000 a month. But it's... Fancy. It served the purpose uh, for uh, you know, our community then. Can you talk about the Pride Parade? Oh, yeah. And the uh, well, you know, San Francisco, um, I'm not sure at that time how many cities had a good Pride Parade, but San Francisco had one of the largest ones. So the customers that came into the bar, they said, well, I mean, we need to have a float in the gay parade. I said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So we formed a committee of, of patrons, of people who came to the bar, and we decided we were going to get a float, and <coughs> it was a beautiful thing. Everybody was participating. We had one guy who was like a tailor. He made outfits for everybody, and my daughter was six years old. We had a beautiful float with African-American colors, and it was not just African-Americans involved in the float and on the float either, but we have a right to express our, you know, feelings and stuff like that. And uh, it was very receptive, uh, you know, when we were going down the parade route, people were cheering us and stuff. We had good music, and I had a little princess on top of the float, and she was going like this. <laughs> <laughs> she was six years old. <laughs> well, and the theme of the float was, like, through the ages or something, right? So there right. was, like, Egyptian costumes and then like Victorian costumes. I think I had like a Victorian right. costume on and there was probably future people I would like to. Right. <laughs> and we, have, we, have, we had a few pictures of that too uh, that we, we found and so forth. Mm -hmm. But okay. um, Well, yeah, I think uh, I mean, another one of the things oh. that I... Oh. oh, no, go ahead. No, you go. I was going to say we're going we're gonna to have questions if people want to ask questions, but 
we want to talk about the arts, I think, too. Yes, <laughs> we did. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 what did we want to say about the uh, about the arts? <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, I know for myself, I've always, you know, really admired what you've done and these like really tangible um, actions and things that you fought for. And so I know for myself, I always kind of wonder like, well, does art have a part in this? And it does. Um, but it is a little bit different, and is it okay that I'm an artist, Dad? What do you about <laughs> <laughs> art? I'm so proud, and I'm so proud of this, um, you know, the studio, museum, and Holland. It's so funny, you know, coincidence. One time I was here in, in 1999 in Holland, and I took a picture of the museum, and uh, we found that picture recently. It was so wonderful. How many years ago was that? Like, 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, this was in our hearts, and um, <clears throat> and uh, it's just it's so wonderful how uh, you know th- what the museum does for people, allow bring in people and challenges for a long time. The art is just not what some white man can paint a Mona Lisa uh, about, and it just. Um, helps uh, the community grow and express themselves. Oh, man, it's so joyful for me to, and I'm learning about art and myself and my daughter, mm-hmm. too. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, I mean, I think definitely in the bar, a lot of artists were involved, you know, like with the right, designing the, the float and like the... the logo was designed by an artist and, um, yeah. And uh, I guess you had also mentioned like Emery Douglas and uh, um, like during the time of the Panthers and Angela and all of the you know graphics that people did. But I think also s- something that we talked a bit about is that art, you know, can help people imagine things a different way. Um, so it isn't even just political art that helps moves, you know, or like easily classifiable as political art, but. E- um, just the experience of getting outside of yourself and I mean dreaming and imagining is what's at the root of all of this activism you know it, it, it takes uh, a certain headspace to imagine things being better than they are right. um, and hopefully art can do that and I think for me and for a lot of my generation you know we look back to these stories and try to figure out okay well how can we do that or what's stopping us from organizing like this now? Or how come we d- it didn't work? Like, I mean, you guys did a lot of amazing things, but how come we didn't have a revolution? How come the cops are still killing people? You know, how come there's one million people, one million black people in jail right now? And how come this is okay? And I guess, you know, neither one of us has all the answers, but I feel like looking back and studying these things and uh, whether it's through like scholarship or through art or through an intimate conversation, um, mm-hmm. you know we're trying to honor the past and learn from the past and just keep just keep studying. Right. Um, <coughs> there's one kind of point I want to make I c- completely forgot about, but uh, in Sadie's art upstairs, if you saw uh, her uh, art artwork, it started off with Cassandra Barnett, and that was my great grandmother and she was born in 1814 and she was the way that we were able to track everybody in our family because every barnet and hundreds probably thousands because there's a i got a hundred nephews and nieces myself but you know so we all go back to cassandra barnet she was born in 1814 that's during slavery and um you know we were able to we have family reunions and we go to their grave site that's there and so forth. Anyhow, just Maybe one last thing we should explain before we open up to questions is about the E on the end of the name. Okay, well... <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? Um, I, I don't know if I told you, but uh, there were 11 of us in my family, and I was a baby. So during the course, uh, uh, most of my relatives, my cousins and so forth, the name is Barnett. Well, a lot of other Smith Joneses and everything else, of course, but the Barnetts that, um, you know, still have the name Barnett, 
is spelled B A R N E T T. And my name is spelled B A R N E T T E. So, you know, people are like, well, how? What's, are we related? You're the N in Jermaine, and we don't. So one day, I asked my father, I said, Daddy, why do we have an E on our name? And evidently, he had been asked that question for years and years, and by the time I got to ask, he wasn't very patient about answering it. And I bounded the film on you, you don't use it. <laughs> but it, it turns out that um, I think from his tour in World War I to France, that the French people were so welcoming and, and so, so showed so much love to the African American soldiers that were there that somehow they tacked it on or he tacked the E on the end of his name. So we have hundreds of people now with the E on the end, but we're still Barnett's with the E or without the E. Sometimes it's in a parentheses at family reunions. Um, but anyway, and I think Possibly there are some questions, maybe. Nico, I think, has a microphone. She does. Can I wave? Nico knows how to do Hello. the wave, too. Yeah, just put your hand up if you have a question for Sadie or for Rodney or anyone else that's here. And if not, that's fine, too. Oh, yeah. Um, I just kind of want to, like, have you ask a question that relates to this slide. I kind of want to hear a little bit about the relationship um, and your experience with your organizing and activism and life when you became a father and with Sadie in your life. Uh, okay, I, I'm not sure what the answer to the question. Do you want to know about how I organized when I became a father? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think at, at that time, one of the things that happened was, um, you know, you needed to work no matter what you did, what kind of organizing you were or whatever, you needed to do that plus have a job. So when I was going to um, San Francisco State, I was working at night, but then we got a, a, a break in the summertime. Victoria Mercado had um, got involved with um, her job, uh, and it was a union job in San Francisco in the ILWU. And um, so... <coughs> She uh, would let me, hey, Rodney, they're hiring out where I work, if, you know, because it was summer and I wasn't in school. So I said, well, oh, okay, I'll come and apply. And then, so I applied for uh, a job in San Francisco, and it was a unionized place by International Longshore and Warehouseman's Union. <coughs> and it was, um, it just really opened up a whole new perspective for me that working people have a right to have a voice in their working conditions and in how much wages they make and the safety uh, you know on, on the job and stuff so I found people that were uh, involved in, in, in that and Victoria had become a leader in that and they had elections you know have rank and file you elect somebody to represent you in negotiations or if you have a problem where the contract violated uh, you know she became the, the chief steward and after working with her for a year or so she wanted to go uh, uh, to south america and, and, and so forth so she um resigned and then they winded up electing me <coughs> a chief steward and first time they fired after she left the company got real bold and was trying to do all kinds of things and they fired a couple of people one guy they claimed he, uh, six months ago he was out on the back dock smoking a cigarette and so they're gonna fire him and so they fired two guys and i said oh man okay i i know what to do you file a grievance <coughs> I filed a grievance, and they fired me too. <laughs> but the good thing was, is that after that happened, the other people we worked with, they went to the union house and said, look, we want something done about this. We're not going to have no grievances filed and wait for years for it to be resolved and see if we win it. We want to strike. And it turns out there was a, what we call a business agent in the union office that said, well, you know, if you really feel strongly about, you know, this striking and so forth, here's what you should do. Don't go on strike. Go inside and go on strike. You go inside and you sit down, you just don't do any work. And the manager's going to come around and tell you, you 
get to work, this is a direct order, blah, blah, blah. But nobody goes to work. And if you have that kind of unity, you can win your demands. <coughs> sure enough, that's what happened. Everybody came to work, refused to do any work, just sat there. And the managers came saying, you have to, you're going to get fired. And in an hour, we were all back to work. You know, they brought the people they fired back and they brought me back. So anyhow, uh, so I began to get more involved uh, outside of the uh, plant that I worked in and so forth and so on. And actually, um, that's where I met Ellen, Sadie's mother. <laughs> and the funny thing about it is um, people that I knew said, stay away from her. She's a radical. <laughs> I said, okay. So when she would come around me, I'd go run that away. She'd come with a petition uh, to sign and stuff like that. And then after talking, I said, well, you know what? I think we have more in common with each other than you guys <laughs> than we do with you. Anyhow, so we became, we got really close. And actually, I think what you call you, we fell in love and had a little baby named Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so that's what I did with um, a lot up until the time I retired in the last few years. I was uh, I worked uh, in the labor movement. And mommy too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question? Oh. Mm -hmm. um, thank you guys. That was amazing. First of all, um, I have a question for Sadie. Um, I just would really love for you to kind of if you even can to articulate, I think I know kind of in maybe like emotionally or something and obviously sitting here and seeing you guys why your family history and why these stories are so important to you. But I'm really interested in, because you're also a very formal, very conceptual, like very rigorous artist. Um, and these are very, not that these things are not formal and rigorous, of course they are in some way, but I'm just really curious about how do you think about how you translate these stories into the work that you make and why are you why do you do it and why do you translate it in ways that you know like you could make a documentary like you could interview your dad and write a book about it you could do all sorts of things why do you do the things that you do with these stories um good question um i mean i i think that it just sort of seems like the most important thing in the world. <laughs> um, like what my parents did and dedicated their lives to. Um, but I think there's something about the way that my brain works and I'm just an artist. Like I'm not um, necessarily linear about things. Um, I don't um, like to do a lot of public speaking for sometimes you have to even as an artist they don't tell you that um but i don't know I like i like to make things and i like to make beautiful things and i just could tell that i like had to uh deal in this realm of poetry and that's just what i do um but it had to be about something and it had to be about what i know and there's so many stories that people can tell and need to tell um but I figure if you just tell the story that you're given, then you can't really go wrong. And I feel like it's uh, sort of my responsibility to talk about all the amazing things that have happened in our family. And when I think about you know, how I came to be, it's sort of this improbable thing. And, and I don't have that many answers, but I have a lot of questions. And art seems like... Um, a great way to interrogate those things um, and I, I mean I love conceptual art I love reading about art um, I love abstraction um, I love abstract art um, and so I think it's that's like a, a part of my makeup or those are all the tools that are like spread across you know in my studio is like a little bit of Black Panthers here a little bit of Soloit there and like it just um, the more they come together the more true I feel that they um, have the more true the work feels to me um, and I think it's also you know an, ar an argument that uh, that people 
need art that isn't uh, just necessarily like s serving the movement, but is challenging the movement and is uh, reshaping the way that we think about things. And um, so that's what I, I try to do. Great. Did you want to say something, Dad? No, I, I, I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> uh, just wanted to ask, when you're forging your identity as an artist, are you filtering your art in your current environment through family history, or are you reframing your family history to look at the world in perspective? How do, how do you differentiate or, or blend the two? Is that like a chicken and the egg kind of question? <laughs> Not quite. No. Um, I mean, I think... Uh, I think perhaps I filter my family history um, through this like lens that is my authorship and is the way I look at things. Um, like I think this photograph and especially like the uh, maybe a little bit larger version that's like on the program. Um, I mean, it's you know just a found family photograph of ours, but it's impossible for me to look at it without looking at like the composition and the colors um, and to me it's it's a, a piece of art um, yeah anybody else yeah Can you <laughs> that <is it? laughs> uh, well, thank you so much I wanted to ask a question about something that Sadie you mentioned at the end um, about uh, current problems that are still existing in our society that are extensions of a lot of what the civil rights movement and um, a lot of the different activist movements you were part of were working against and I guess I just wanted to ask if um, you had any feelings based on your experience about um, what can be a successful strategy for the problems that we're still facing today yeah well <coughs> I was afraid somebody might ask that was that I really don't have the answers, but I think like what Sadie's talking about, art from what's happening should really be alarming, you know, to us that we need to do something, that we need to organize, that the society is changing. Any country that has how many twenty million people in prison and uh shooting down four to five hundred black people a year there's something happening that needs to be um, organized against and that those statistics should be alarming to everybody to tell you the truth and i think a lot of it is we're just more people are finding out uh that that's what's going on um and i think um if we don't do something about it, don't organize, and I don't think we could just strictly organize on the internet. We have to do some old-fashioned organizing where we organize in the community, have house meetings and stuff like that, and have speakers and, and build a real strong movement because we're in trouble, I think, in this country, and not just black people because, you know, what happens to black people is somebody is going to be next that it's happening to. Right now we have police chiefs that are going to Israel to figure out how to deal with uh, community problems the way that they deal with them in Israel. I don't think that's an answer that we want to have to uh, deal with. But I, I don't really have um, you know, uh, a way of saying this is what we have to do. I'm just glad I have a feeling that the um, Black Lives um, matter movement is an important thing that's happening uh, even before that i was really impressed with the occupy movement i said wow that's amazing that um, people have that consciousness that you know there's a class thing you know the country is becoming more and more controlled by just a small minority of people and for the basis of making more, more profit and that's something that's not working in the interest of the majority of, of people in the country. So I don't have the answers. Hopefully somebody does. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we appreciate um, you sharing all of the knowledge that you have. And, you know, it's not your responsibility to figure out uh, 
what we do with it or what the next generation does with it, but it's sort of a consolation, uh, consolation to know that, you know, how bad things are has to somehow <laughs> lead towards the change. Mm. That's like a really pe optimistic, pessimistic. Uh, I have a, an example of, of something that, you know, maybe a lot of people don't know. When I was living in San Francisco, in 1970s, you could walk into a job with no experience, making $12 an hour to start with. And we have people now, how many years later is that? 40 something or whatever it is, they can't get a job making that much money now. That's a with big... With two degrees. Yeah, that's a big setback. And you have unemployment, you know, things go up and down, but, you know, how can people justify walking into a job 50 years later, making what we made, and my rent was $100 a month, you know, I was making $12 an hour, and I got relatives that, that can't even get work, who have college degrees, and that's the other thing, I was, we had a discussion, people going to college and having to take out student loans, where they have to get a job and have to pay a hundred thousand, fifty thousand dollars in student loans. That's like domestic. What do you call it? Um, indentured servitude. Indentured servitude. You know, you have to pay all this money out and work until you pay it back, and then maybe you can start working on your own life. That's crazy. Anyhow, things are going, you know, really backwards for a lot of people, and maybe hard to tell, but I, I, I'm witness to how things have changed in the negative. Okay. Well. On that note, <laughs> change the world. Thanks, Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much, and thank you, Nico. And drink a glass of wine on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> Not in the gallery. <laughs> Get a big I will. <laughs> we did great. We did great. Right. And I hope um, people understand um, the relationship of what we're you know, trying to talk about. <laughs>